So, are there any questions about projects? Or, um, I mean, your next project, unfortunately, you don't have much time because of the, the way semester is set up. Um, you, you have like a month or so left. And, and the other thing is we need to figure out what exact time we're gonna uh, have the, exam, uh, the project presentation because Jerry needs to fly in, so he wanted to buy the ticket. I think we sort of agreed uh, to have it on a Saturday. I'll send an email out to the class to say if Saturday's still okay, um, but we need to figure out what exact time to, to do that, right? Yeah, I think that's what I think we... Yeah, so um, don't push it to the end because I'm, I'm guessing that you have other classes and stuff, right? Um, so I, I looked at the, you know, I browsed through your reviews for this paper and a lot of you had concerns about the evaluation, you know, or, or sort of lack thereof. Um, the, the history behind it was at, at the time that they were developing this, they were porting it into uh, BST and BST was actively being sent out to other campuses, sort of like what happens with Linux these days, right? So evaluation may not have been formal, but this went into production system. So this is sort of like if, you know, ext3, um, if, I don't know how many of you have seen performance data on ext3, but you sort of take it for granted because it's sort of the default file system, it sort of works kind of thing. So they have that kind of uh, stuff, right? The other thing is it's sort of old, so you'd think that this is sort of like uh, um, not that relevant, but it is. I mean, there are some tweaks to this to make it more um, relevant for today, but a lot of the techniques that they introduced are still still being used, right? Uh, unless you go to like a NTFS or something which is completely different, but the um, other file systems pick up a lot of the ideas from here, right? So it's not it's not as old as it should be, right? And the, which may or may not be a good thing, right? Is that, is that a good thing that should we be improving the file systems beyond what they did or, or what have you, right? And this is sort of what I was kind of alluding to because I think, I think a lot of things that they did, um, we, we had to look into why they did what they did and see where the hardware is going and whether it's still valid, right? And that's sort of what we like to discuss. Um, but yeah, so that, that's the, I was gonna say something, but I forget. Um, so first looking at the state of how things were, right? So, oh, the, the paper we read last week uh, was actually after this paper, right? So this, that happened after this one because it was published in the, in the journal in 84, right? Which means that the research was probably done in uh, early 80s, like earlier than that. And that paper was in, what, 85 or 85 or so, right? So it's likely that they used this file system for their analysis, in the, the file system uh, access paper, right? So they didn't know the, the observations such as files are small, they're, they're short lived and all those things. They probably knew it by observing the stuff but not in a formal sense. So they don't refer to the other paper, right? So the, the, the state of the disk back then were, disks were slow, right? They were 3600 RPM or so. They were dumb, right? So we were kind of going from, this is sort of the time when you start to have desktop hard drives, these hard drives that can go into your PC. So, so for a, before then, you used to have machines being you know, big and mainframes and stuff. Even this, this, this prop, disk was probably big by our, our today's standard, but it was small enough to be moving into real machines. So back in the, in the mainframe days, they used to have what called I.O. processors, which are essentially units which had the disk uh, storage stuff and then some processing to it. So they moved here to reduce cost to uh, you know, putting your disk into the system. The silicon was still expensive, so the disk was dumb. It didn't do anything, right? So you have to tell it what it has to do. It'll do what you want and it'll come back, right? It'll only do one thing. You can't do many things. There's no scheduler inside. There's no cache inside. So if you want it to read something, it'll read the stuff to you. If you want to write something, you write it stuff to you. It's up to you to run the scheduling algorithm, right? So the old file system that, which did something like this, 
did not look anything into the hardware at all. So it was still looking at it from the abstract concept of how files should be. Um, I didn't realize all this stuff, right? So some of the, the, the problems you face is you have to run the disk scheduling algorithm, which you might have re read in undergrad class. You know, the scan, the C scan, and all those things. But you're trying to look at the way this got laid out, right? And there are other issues that pop up here. One is if you want to read sequentially, right? If you want to read the data in the same sector. So, for example, if you have data which were in the same sector, two blocks which are right next to each other, right? We sort of assume that I can sequentially read both of those, right? But in this model, it's dumb. So it only do what you tell it to do, right? So if you ask the hard drive to read this block, it'll read this block, give the answers back to you, right? So if you immediately ask it to read another block, right, and the request come to the hard, hard drive, the disk is still spinning, right? Which means that if the disk is spinning this way, by the time the, request, the new request comes back, the disk might have spun to a certain spot. Right? I think they're talking this is like six blocks here, right? So I couldn't read the next block. The next sequentially readable block was actually far from where I was, right? And, and the actual distance depends on the CPU, how fast my CPU is, how fast I'm able to re reissue the, the request, and how fast my the CPU scheduler, the disk scheduler runs inside the, the OS scheduler runs, right? So the OS only schedules a request every 10 millisecond, then this will keep moving off, right? So this is kind of a weird time where the hard disk, the way you set these blocks depends on your processor, depends on the processor load, depends on how fast the processor can process stuff. So if you take this disk and move it to another machine, then all of them will be wrong, because that processor may be faster or slower, and the time to issue a new, object, new request is, can be bad, right? So if you, if you, if you thought that you're going to be ready for the next request up here, and if you're able to come in sooner, then the disk will wait, right? So if you came in while the disk hasn't come there, you'll wait. If, you're, if you thought you're going to be coming some, sometime if you were late, right, then you have to wait for the whole disk rotation, right? So you, you have motivation to keep this bound tight. You have motivation to make sure that you can schedule the next request fast enough in sort of a real-time fashion, right? And again, you're doing this with processors which were not that capable because you know very quickly some of the experiments show that the processor load is like 95% or something for the disk alone, right? So you're operating in a model where the disks were dumb and didn't have any cache, and all the CPU was doing all the work for the disk, and it had to understand how the disk was laid out. It has to know everything about the disk so it can get some sort of a performance, right? Um, and so life was kind of hard, right? So moving forward. Disks are faster, right? The, the, the RPM is faster, which I don't think is really ma matters all that much for, for this discussion, right? What matters is your, your disks now have a lot of silicon. So they have uh, memory, right? So they have, if you look at, if you buy any hard disk, you get like what? What's the typical um, buffer size on the disk these days? Eight megabyte, and the the larger disk have you know like some of the larger ones have 32 megabyte, right? So there's there's a lot of memory here. So that means I don't have to <coughs> read or write directly to the disk. I can send some requests to the disk. It can buffer it and then write it out on, on its own pace, right? So if I have a 32 megabyte buffer here on the disk, right, and then I have a controller here, right? So if I make a request, I can make a request for consecutive blocks, and those blocks will be stored inside this memory, inside its own disk memory, and the disk controller can read or write whatever it wants to do in a more optimal fashion, right? So the, the, the modern disks don't do some of the stuff that we, we talk about here, but the modern disks still deal with this kind of a thing. I mean, the, this disk spins and all those things are still, still it, it deals with, right? But the logic doesn't have to be in the operating system. It can be moved into the disk controller, right? The other, other thing which happens is disks are smarter in some sense, because that when you have a larger and larger disk, the probability of, of some sectors being bad goes up, right? So it may be the case that when they manufacture the disk, they find that this particular sector was, was corrupt. So they, they do a low-level formatting of the disk. They find that this sector was gone. So they built in enough redundancy inside the system. So they can have, say, this is a sector only for, for bad, bad blocks. 
So they're going to remap this sector over here internally and keep track of this mapping inside the disk. You know, it says like this one happens to be pointing to here, internally into the hard disk. Nothing to do with operating system. Operating system does not have to know any of this stuff. And they can do this remapping inside the hard disk. So the controller not only can do this scheduling, uh, it can also do this remapping. And until these things fill up, you don't notice anything from the disk. You know, so while operating, you may have a certain number of blocks fail, but it's, they are masked from you, right? So that's the state of disk right now, right? But the fundamental th thing still exists. The, the notion that something has to spin sort of still exists. The file system <coughs> that they talked about, the old file system, uses the inode structure we kind of alluded to in the last lecture, right? So essentially you have, this is the logical structure of how a Unix file is stored, right? So you should sort of look at it from the undergrad perspective, right? So you take a block, you call it inode, it's no different from any other block in terms of how it's stored on the disk, right? So you have, you allocate certain numbers for metadata, right? Like file name and file modification bits and so on and so forth. And then you have to have some, some number of entries to store where the data blocks are, right? And here you're trying to optimize based on how big the file expected files and all those things. So you allocate certain number for direct blocks. So let's say, let's, let's call the data blocks as D. So you allocate certain number for direct blocks you allocate set number for indirect blocks, right? So this is one level of indirection. Then you may allocate another one for, I think, I think you also have, does that make sense, right? I mean, of course, this is a much bigger tree, right? The three third level indirection is a much bigger tree. So you essentially have some blocks directly accessed from your inode structure, and some of them go through one level of indirection where, where the entry points to a block which has pointers to where the data blocks are. And then, then, then there are some which point to a block which points to another block which points to data block. And then you also have the points to a block which points to a block which points to a block which points to a data block, right? And usually, the, as the file becomes larger, you go through these kind of a stuff. These kind, you go through more references, right? And each one of these things have to go through the file system as a reference. So if I want to access byte one, right, I have to reference two blocks because I need to get this one plus I need to get this one, right? If I have to get something which happened one byte which happens to be here, I have to read this block, I have to read this block, I have to read this block, and I have to go here. So I need lots of disk accesses, right? And this model, like we kind of talked about in the last class, makes sense if you assume files are small. If your files are small, you expect that most of them to be caught here, right? And file accesses are sequential, so you expect to amortize the cost of doing all this stuff, right? So if you do sequential, or if you read small files, then this is not a bad notion of how things are done, right? And the number of blocks you can have direct blocks, what does it depend on? How many blocks you can have the direct block? What does it depend on? How big a file you can store with this concept, what does it depend on? Size. On the block size, right? On, so, all these are fixed size blocks, right? So the block size de defines how, how much you can store, right? So this direction, indirection, if you do this simple math, will tell you how many blocks a file can have. So whatever the block size times the number of blocks gives you the maximum file size you can store, right? And how many entries you can have depends on the block size. So if you have only space for one indi indirect block, then you know it, it, this one restricts how many blocks you can have and what kind of performance you can have, right? So you have motivation to make this block size as big as possible, because the, the larger the block size becomes, at least for the inode case, the more direct blocks you can have, right? Because you have to have this, you have to have this, you have to have this. This depends on how many blocks you can have, right? So you, you have motivation to make that as big as possible. So what is the motivation to keep the block size small? Yeah. Yeah, and how do you know how much internal fragmentation you, you would expect? Uh, from average files. 
which is the last paper, the paper we looked at last week, right? So if you do those, the study that we, we, we did last week, then you know what the expected file sizes are, right? So you need to look at your target audience. You would like to know how, how they store the file. You like to sort of draw a distribution of how the file sizes are, right? If, if this happens to be a CDF and this happens to be a file size, a cumulative distribution, right? If you see the if they see the graph to be something like this, right? Let's see, this is 100%. So this line means that up to, um, let's say this is like, you know, 4K, right? Um, actually, um, so if, if this one would mean that most of the files are, are, are big, right? So this, this basically means that up to 4K, the percentage of files which are up to 4K is very small, right? Most of the files tend to be large, right? So if, if this happens to be, let's say, 1 GB, and this happens to be 512, and this happens to be 50%, right? This means that 50% of the, the median size of the files is 512 megabytes, right? So you have to do some kind of a study to find out what the structure is. If on the other hand, if it was like this, right? This means that most, like so, uh, if this happens to be um, like one byte or something, this happens to be 100 bytes or something, right? Then you say 50% of the files are one byte and 90% of the files are, are 100 bytes or something. So you do this kind of a study, then you find out what, what the stuff is, right? So based on this, you want to choose, so you have a competing goal. You either make the blocks larger, so you, you, you can get some of the benefits of, of sequential reads, or, but then you'll suffer from the internal, internal fragmentation, so you have to come with, with a good number, right? That's ongoing battling, have, that, that's why you have to constantly keep doing this effort to figure out what the average file size is, right? So that's, that's one aspect, so that kind of figures out what, what you should have, right? And then you have to recognize that sometimes the files may, so different file systems, you may want to put different files, so you may believe that this is the graph for everybody, except this is the graph that you're gonna see for video data, right? In that sense, you may want to create two file system, one optimized for this and one optimized for this. So I may want to say the block size here should be 512, right? Because I can't go below 512 because that's what the disk gives me as a block size. So I can't make it smaller than 512, so I'm gonna make 512 for this file system. But this one I see it's, it's pretty big, so I, maybe I can do 64 KB as a, as the block size for this file system, right? Which means that I'm gonna use as many disk blocks as I, I want to create a file system block, which is the size. So I should be able to use different block size for different, um, different kinds of files. And the way you do that in the new file system is I create different, different file systems on different partition. So I say create a single disk, I create two partitions, so I can, I, I have the ability to uh, make one file system with 512 bla, uh, byte and another one with 64, okay? I think, I think you can do that with the old file system too, right? So that's the motivation for you to do both of those, right? <coughs> so that, those are the parameters of how, how they were. The problem that working with this at this level, when it translates to real life, is that at this point, all I said was you have, so to access the first byte, you have to read two blocks, right? I didn't say anything about where those blocks were, right? So if I was not smart enough to do the thing right, remember this have the, the, the sectors and rotation latency and all those things, right? Which means that you have one disk head, typically for one platter, so which means that you can, you're only reading at one point. So I, I can be reading, say, at, at this point, and the disk is spinning, right? So I can continue to read all the stuff in that sector because it, you know, the, the disk spins under me. So if I wait long enough, I get the stuff. So if I have to read something from here, I have to wait for some time before this thing spins and comes under the head. If I have to read something over here on a different track, I have to move the head over physically to that particular sector and wait. So I need to have the access latency and then rotational latency to wait for the thing to happen, right? So that's part of how the disk works. So I, I can't have reading heads for all the different tracks. So I have to have one which kind of moves back and forth. And this is an artifact of, the, uh, of how the mechanical stuff works. I mean, I need to have mechanical heads for these things. And you know, the, the, the mechanics of how the disk works are hard enough that without having to be able to put heads for everything, right? So that means to get good performance, 
I have to keep work with the system. So I need to make sure that I don't do this exercise a lot, right? So the worst performance can be if I put one block here and one block here. If the inode happens to be here, and the data block happens to be here, right? So even though I said you only need two block read, it may happen that I have to read this first to know where the block is. I need to read this first, and then I have to seek all the way across, and then wait for the data to come under me, right? So if, if one file had the inode here and the data block right next to it in the sequentially readable, the way they define it, right? Because remember, the I have to wait for six uh, blocks to read it, right? If they are both right next to each other, I may get much better performance than if they are kind of apart, right? So what this does not show you is logically this is how it's organized, but it doesn't take anything about the physics into consideration at all, right? So the first file system, the old file system, did what made sort of sense because they, they said all the inodes should be clubbed to, at the beginning of the disk. Let's say the inodes are here. The data is assigned somewhere here, and they're all over the place. They, they tend to kind of randomly get distributed. And since you're doing this, this you know, reading one, you're doing a synchronous read of each block, you may be seeking back and forth, right? So you get really horrendous performance because of the mismatch between what your inode structure, what your logical structure is, and what the physical structure is. And all this paper is trying to do is not really change this model, right? I mean, they, they change it a little bit to make this metadata bigger. I mean, the, the file system used to allow 14 byte uh, file names. They made it into a larger uh, size, but essentially they didn't touch this model. I mean, they, they said, let's have the logical model. What we're going to do is we're going to understand how the, the operating system now understands how the disk is laid out. And it's going to place these things in a certain fashion such that you get good performance and you get the same logical stuff. The logical thing still seems okay, but the mapping from logical to physical was, the, was, was not good. So they, they showed that if you, if you are naive, I think, I think the old file system got 2% of the disk uh, throughput, right? Because it was spending most of the time just basically seeking. 2% is not that good, especially in those days when the disk was really slow. And they made it up to 47%, right? So what are the techniques that they use to get better performance? They increase the block size. Yeah, they increase the block size, right? Block size is now bigger, right? Um, how does that help? So instead of requesting you know, four or five small block size, you just request one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so instead of requesting, you know, so if, if you had a file which is like, say, 4K, right, in the old scheme, you would have eight, eight blocks, right? So it is possible that eight blocks were scattered all over the place. Now you can have them all uh, close together. Now you can have them all sequentially. So when I make a request, I can say start reading and read eight blocks, right? Because I, I don't have to request a new, uh, new stuff. So essentially, I get to get at least eight disk blocks before it has to seek, right? So that makes an uh, improvement, right? So what are the things that they do that, um, that you find interesting? They organize the hash drive into like a different uh, cylinder. Mm -hmm. um, so like, and then inside the cylinder, they divide them into blocks. Mm -hmm. And then when you allocate blocks, you know, all five, they try to keep all the blocks in the same cylinder. Yeah, so does that, does that make sense? It must, it must have made sense because you guys read the paper, right? So what they do is they understand that the disk is all over the place, right? So they, what they're trying to achieve is locality, right? They, they, don't want, they want the, the stuff to be close together. They want all the later stuff to be close together, right? So they, so they assume that if, it, if it's a file, right, they, it's, it's good to assume that all the file contents should be sort of together, right? Why would you assume that? files are read sequentially. Yeah, so most files are read sequentially. So you assume that files are read sequentially. And also files, I mean, which they don't say it in this paper, but the other paper said files are also read from start to end, right? So they are, they're read sequentially and they're read start to end, right? It's not like you read one block, wait for, for, a, for a couple of minutes, and then write the ne read next block. You sort of read the whole file 
all at once, which means that if you move your disk head to be reading the first block, right? If you keep the rest of the blocks in the vicinity, that's good because then you avoid seeking too, too far, right? So I want to be able to keep all the blocks within close to each other, right? So forgetting how they did this in the paper, how would you do that? So suppose I assigned one block here, right? Why can't I just assign the rest of the file along this stuff? Why can't I just assign the whole thing on the same track? Can I do that? Yes, yes you can, but then you know, your this head you know, have to rotate around mm -hmm. instead of you know, move you know, sideways. Yeah, moving sideways is actually more expensive, right? Moving sideways is, is more, much more expensive, so you want to avoid that, right? The, from the, the disk parameters, moving sideways is much more expensive because it's a physical movement, right? So if the disk is moving, you, the, your best bet is to read on the same track, right? So, um, so if the disk is moving this way, if I store the first block, the ideal position for the next block would be right behind it, and three to be right behind it, and four to be right behind it, and so on, right? So can I use a scheme which allocates all the blocks for a file right next to each other on the same track? Does it happen that if you read the first block, that the second block, could because the disk is spinning, mm -hmm. the second block goes past before you can read it? They, they had that problem because of the way the scheduling has to happen, right? But ignore that, right? The, the way you can ignore that is I think you can read every sixth block because the way they had to do the stuff. So you'll have to do one here, and then after the sixth block, two, after the sixth block, three, right? In their world, that's what you would schedule. You would schedule one here, two here, three here, every six ones, right? But in the modern world, you don't have to do that. I mean, you can, you can put them all next to the, and the, and the drive will do that, right? So, but but the, the, the concept of, should you assign all of them right next to each other? That seems to be the right way to go rather than whatever they're trying to do, right? Because then you get the best performance, right? So why aren't they doing that? Yeah. It makes the allocation more difficult. And if you did that at some point, performance in one side and do the radius of the drive would be a lot better than the other side, right? Because the so it's the first point, right? Why is it? Why does it make it difficult? Because if file size is changing, mean, you have to. You might uh, you, you go say you wrote a file and then you put up some more tracks and then. The continuation of the file may be 20 tracks away, and then you have to seek. So it's not very consistent performance over the life of the file system. Yeah, I think, I think you mentioned it a little bit, right? Which is, you don't know. So when you create a file, you don't know how big the file is going to be. And that's the problem that comes throughout the system, right? What I said is true if we knew exactly how big the file is, right? And if you, you all have programmed with PASIX structure, right? When you, when you create a file, you, you say open and create a file. You don't say how big the file can be, right? So we don't know how big the file would be, right? If I had known, if, if the system call took the argument of how big the file size would be, and you're not allowed to make it any larger than what it was, then I think this is the best way to go, right? Which is pre-allocate everything in a nice fashion and be done with it, right? But you don't know that. So in typical things, you say open a file, file to create. I want to create a file, right? And I don't know how big this file would be, right? If I look at this graph, it doesn't say anything. All it says is, on average, I expect files to be small, which means that I should only allocate one byte block to it, right? So if I look at this line as my guide, what I should do is I should only worry about one block because 90% of the files are going to be within one block, right? Which may be a good thing, but the, the large files will suffer because I'm not using any of the other disk stuff, right? If I look at this graph, which shows that most files are large, then I would have to pre-allocate a whole bunch of tracks to a file, but if a file happens to be small, it'll waste a whole bunch of stuff, right? And that's, that's the thing, that's the stuff they have to worry about, and that's the thing that the file system have to worry about. If you knew what, how the, big the file should be, we can do a better job, but we don't know, because the files can grow. I mean, one of the nice things about files is they can grow bigger and stuff, so I can't really do this optimization. Rather, I'm going to say, I'm going to take a bunch of cylinders into a cylinder group, and cylinder is like this on the different uh, platters, right? So I want to say, let's say three of those, right? I'm, I'm gonna say these three 
on the outer end. I'm going to consider them to be a cylinder group. I'm going to do operations where I treat stuff inside the cylinder group as a group. So all the files, I'm not, I, I can't really give them all one track or give them all one cylinder because I don't know how, how big the file is going to be. But I'm going to cluster these stuff so that all the related files would tend to, would be allocated from stuff, stuff here, right? So maybe all the related files would, would get good uh, performance, right? How do I know some files are related? How do I know relationships among files? What is the, um, how do I know if you access one file, you're likely to uh, access another file? Because that's the relationship we are, we are looking for, right? We can't say anything about a single file, but I want to say this cluster of files would be accessed together. So maybe I can't optimize for a single file, but if I can optimize for all these files which, are, which will be accessed together, then I'll be good, right? How do we know what is this relationship we, um, we would like? Which, which is what this work is, uh, depends on, right? So they assume that uh, files and directories are related? Yeah, so files and directories, all the, direct, the, the single directories are related, right? And this is sort of what the previous paper found too, right? The files in a single directory are related because if you have a hierarchical directory structure like what Unix has, right? Uh, because the VAX, VMS, and stuff only had one level of directory. So, so uh, in VAX, you, you had two levels, right? Your username, which, so your home directory had all the files that you wanted, right? So you're forced to kind of mix all the unrelated files. Whereas in Unix, you have different directories, uh, directories, right? So you're supposed to have all the related files into a single directory. So if I can use a directory as indicator, then I can assume that all the files in a single directory are likely to be part of the same project. So if you access one file, you're likely to another, like another one. So I can create a cylinder group. I can assign a inode data structure for the cylinder group. I can put all the related files for that particular directory into the same group. So what I change is I take this disk, I split them up into individual cylinder groups, right, depending on how many cylinders I can have. And for each cylinder group, I want to put a different directory, right? So rather than take, treat the whole file system as one thing, I'm going to treat them in each each directory into a separate sort of file system, right? Each each one has its own stuff, right? And that's the biggest contribution here, right? They assume that this is this is what the disk does, and they can't do the optimal thing, which is you know assign everything sequentially because they don't know how big the files are, right? But they're trying to keep these things sort of together, right? And 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 get good performance, right? Does that work all the time? What are, the, what are the negative? So the positives are now you have essentially, let's say this is a cylinder group, right? This is cylinder group one, and another cylinder group is, right? I'm just, I just split those two, split this large segment two things. Let's assume this is cylinder group one, this is cylinder group two. I'm going to have all the inodes for the files here, right? And ideally, I would like to have inodes for this direct, so this is directory one. Let's say I put directory one here. Let's say I put directory two up here, right? All the files for this directory would have their high nodes allocated from here. All the data blocks for this directory would be allocated from this cylinder group. All the direct, all the uh, I nodes for the second directory would be allocated here. So if everything goes well, right, we know that Files in the same directory are accessed sequentially. Files in the same directory are accessed right next to each other. Files in the same directory grow and, and, and fail right next to each other. So I allocate everything here. So if you're operating on this directory, you get good locality because things are, are close here. If you operate on this directory, things are close here, right? Have we done? So what are the negatives of this approach? What about the space utilization? In the old approach, in the way that the old Unix did, all blocks were equally likely, to, I mean, they didn't differentiate between blocks, right? Which meant that you can go all the way up to the last block, because you didn't particularly care where the blocks are. As long as some block is free, you used it, right? Of course, you got terrible performance, but forgetting that, right? Um, the, the nice thing with the old file system was you got terrible performance regardless of what, because it was all random, so you always got 
poor performance, right? Now you're trying to do this optimization. So if things worked out well, right, all the contents from this directory will fall into this one, right? So if it was magically well organized, and let's say this directory can hold 20 gigabyte, and this can store 10 gigabyte because number of sectors are different. And if it happened that directory one had 20 gigabyte worth of file, if directory two had 10 gigabyte worth of file, everything is, is awesome, right? I mean, you get the best things you can hope for, right? But the same thing we talked about before happens here too. When I create a directory, I have no idea how big it's going to be. Right? When I create a directory, I have no, no idea how many files are going to be, what the file sizes are, and all those things. So if I do this stuff, as long as I have infinite number of cylinder groups, I'm OK. But if I don't have infinite number of cylinder groups, if I have a finite number of cylinder groups, then I'm forced to do uh, some kind of uh, um, load balancing. Right? So I may have to say, this should be directory 1 and directory 3 even though I have no clue how big directory one would become or directory three would become, right? So I have to do this kind of uh, stuff, right? The more I have to do this stuff, in the worst case, things can go bad because in the worst case, the directory three may take over and then you have to find something else. So you have to you know, fall over from this group to another group and all those things, right? There's another case which can happen. One is if you had a large, very large file, right? So suppose you have in the directory one, you didn't have directory three, Right? The first thing the user did was in the directory one, they created a 20 gigabyte file, one file, right? Which means that this one file will take over the entire cylinder group. So if you create file two, right, you have to find something else. You have to go looking for something. So you may steal something from this one, right? Which means that every consecutive file that you create would have long pointers, right? They'll have the inode entry here because the directory entry is here but all the data blocks would be on a different cylinder group, so you have to keep moving on, right? So you have all, run into all kind of problems because of the unpredictable nature of the files, right? If one file takes over the whole space, then all the subsequent files in the same directory would have to go for suboptimal stuff. If I don't allocate another directory to the same cylinder group, then I'll be incredibly wasteful, right? But if I do allocate somebody else and then they interfere with me, I may get bad performance, right? So now I have a varying performance. So in the worst case, right, I, I do all the bad things. In the worst case, I assign to the wrong cylinder group. I assign to a cylinder group, it becomes full and all those things. The worst group, worst case, right, so, you know, worst case may be that I create a directory and then the user creates like 10,000 files, right? So that, that particular cylinder group fills up and then you have to go to a long pointers and stuff. So in the worst case, the performance would be as bad as the old file system. In right? the worst case, it'll be uh, slow as 2% as, as, um, utilization. In the best case, it could be pretty good. 47% is what they got. But worst case, best case, it could be good because best case, all your accesses stay within the cylinder group. The worst case, you, you may have to go random stuff, right? And uh, the metric that they use for keeping the stuff is, this scheme requests you to have options, right? If all I have left is one free block, I have no option. I have to choose whatever it is. So if it happens to be another, another disk, I have to go, right? So you're forced to give up certain amount of disk space to get better performance, right? So I think they use like 10%, which means that you have some options. So you have some cylinder groups which have some empty space. When, when the system gets more and more full, you have less and less options and things fall apart. As you have more and more options, I can do the right thing. I can, I can create as many direct cylinder groups as possible, right? So the performance of the system kind of varies with how much, uh, how, how things have been for a while and, and, and how the disk utilization is, right? So you have to use, uh, give 10% or something. And modern file systems, the, you know, the, the Unix file system actually is still modeled on the same thing. There, there is a little bit of additions, I can, I, I'll tell you in a little bit, but essentially they do the same thing, right? In any of the modern system, how many of you tried using the last byte of uh, blocks from a disk? And what is the impression? A lot of the operating system doesn't begin to mm -hmm. slow down and, and not crash, but it becomes noticeably slow, right? If you if you if you go past that ten percent or five percent utilization, if you the the smaller the I mean the 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 fuller the disk becomes, it becomes very slow because now you have no options. You're, you're going to the 2%. So 
Uh, in the worst case, you can go to the 2% uh, performance, right? So you have to have a lot more disk. So this is, this is more wasteful, right? But you get better performance because you're trying to avoid some of the pitfalls of what, you, what, what, what the systems did, right? So the, the observation was the disks are different than what the file systems were, were looking at. And if you don't take care of those, you have a problem. You, you have performance issues. But taking care of them is not that trivial, right? Because, the, because we don't know how big the files or directories can become. So we can't exactly predict how exactly things are going to happen. But we use the heuristics that they kind of knew when the, when the paper uh, that we read last week kind of showed that people tend to operate on files together. So I use that to say, create this notion of cylinder groups and stuff, and they do some optimization. So they know that if you create a large file, then it, it can take over the whole cylinder group, which is unfair because every other file would suffer. So what they do is, once a file becomes bigger than a certain amount of size, then they allocate it to a different cylinder group, right? Because it's, it's getting too big that they don't want to use the same thing. And the way they do that is the uh, inode structure gives you a good, good indicator, right? So at some point, when you go for multiple indirection level, that's a big enough file, and I'm already going through enough indirections, right? So I kind of move this indirection tree to a different cylinder group, right? So that's their heuristic. So if you, 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 you don't look at all the files, you block them off at the indirection point. So all this indirection would be on a different cylinder group. So if a file were to grow to be this big, right? All this accesses would still be fast because they'll be in a different cylinder group but in, within that single cylinder group. So you're not allocating these ones on a random cylinder groups, right? So this will be in cylinder group one, this will be in cylinder group two. So you get good performance for the first up to this point. Anything more than that, you pay a one-time cost to go from this cylinder group to another cylinder group, but then you get as good a performance because all these blocks happen to be right next to each other. And if you do sequential access, then all of them, you get sequential here, sequential here, you have a transition from this to this, but then you, you, you are good, right? So they have to do certain optimization like that. They have to do, they also talk about lots of annoying optimizations which nobody should be uh, worrying about, such as you have, you know, you can't issue the request for the next block, so you have to worry about how far you have to alloc allocate. So in their scheme, you have to allocate first block here, six, you know, the second block on the sixth stuff, and third block on the sixth stuff, because you're, you're optimizing based too much on the hard drive, right? Right. So let's let's uh, look at the. Yeah. So in, in the in the old old Unix file system, we still do that. I mean, it, it, they call it old, but we still have a notion of a super block, which talks about which has information about all the file systems, all the metadata about the different uh, file systems. Right. Then. You have a notion of inodes, right? Which, which basically let you store the content. So you have the notion of a directory block and flight block. They use the 512 byte data block, um, partly because this were really small, so you needed all the bytes you can get. Um, and 512 was the, the size that the, the hard disk gave you, right? So you, you, you can't go below that. So it's very space efficient because if you know, all the files less than 512 bytes, you, you, I mean, your internal fragmentation is reduced to um, 512, I mean, half of 512 bytes on average, right? Um, but, but essentially, if you just look at the logical structure and don't look at the disk, how it performs, then you tend to allocate it randomly, and random allocation would kill you because of the seek distance. I mean, the, the time to seek to different tracks uh, would kill you. So you really want to, um, take some of the disk into consideration. And they also added stuff that uh, were not really related to what they were talking about, but you know, they were just added, right? For example, the file names were made larger. It was not easy because the, the, the inode blocks were now, now bigger, right? It had no locking, so they added locking, which is, uh, is in part interesting to know, but not, not directly related to what they were, what we're discussing here. Now it had a notion of symbolic links and stuff. So these are nice features which, which still continue to exist, which we still find useful, but not really related to the problem that they're trying to solve, which is the, you don't understand the, the, how the disks are laid out, right? So, so one of the important things that they did was, you know, the files, files uh, blocks are at least 4 KB. They can become larger. I mean, you're, you're allowed to have larger block sizes, um, but the, um, 
but that adds some quirks when you're talking about the boat sector and all those things. So if you, uh, so I think one of the one of the things you talk about is if you have a 16 uh, KB uh, block size, right? The the hardware expects the boot sector to be on the first 8K blocks. So if you had a 16 uh, KB um, blocks, then the the um, the super block had to start from the 16 KB because it can't start from a, um, after the 8 KB. But you don't know that because the information that this is a 16 KB block it's actually in the super block. So they had to do some hacks and stuff, right? But ignoring those, you can you can have as many as you as you wanted. They still have to worry about um, basting space. So they have this notion of a fragment. So they essentially take your block, split it up into small, small fragments, and they can allocate. So you get the best of both worlds in some sense, right? So you can still have 4K block, but if you create the fragments to be 512 uh, bytes, then essentially I can allocate uh, you know, 512 bytes to different files, right? I can allocate different fragments to different files. So I can take one block and then sub-allocate it as fragments to different uh, different um, files, right? It solves the problem that I don't want, I mean, the internal fragmentation, it, it solves, but it's ugly, right? Because now you have to worry about, so the, you're under the same problem. I don't know how big the file is going to be. So if, I, if, you, if you start your file, the first byte you write, Right? I can either choose a fragment or give you a block. Right? If I choose a fragment, and if you don't grow the file size anymore, then I may be okay. But if you grow your file, then all kind of bad things happen, and they try to fix those. Right? They, they try to fix those because what may happen is you have one block, let's say it's, it's split into four fragments. I give this to file one, I give this to file two, I give this to file three. Then if file one wants to grow, right? Do I put it here, right? In which case, it's it's kind of yucky because now you have to um, you're creating this sort of a hose. It, it works, but the performance would suffer, right? So what I, at some point I had to decide to put all of them into one, which may mean I have to move things around, or which may mean I have to do stuff, right? Um, do you think it's still relevant to worry about that last bit of? I mean, have the notion of fragments. Now, now you have to keep track of all this stuff. I mean, somewhere you have to keep track of the notion that there are fragments, and somewhere you have to figure out which which uh, file has those stuff, right? Um, the, you know, the problem is trying to solve is people didn't want to base the last byte of, uh, you know, they want to get the last byte of performance, right? The storage space, right? But when you're talking about if the modern disk if is two terabyte, right? You shouldn't have. You shouldn't have to worry about it because if you do this, your performance gets really poorly, right? Under what circumstances would fragments be really bad? And under what circumstances would fragments not be that bad? Under what circumstances would it be really bad? small files that grow and you start out with a small amount of data and you get a fragment but then it needs to expand and then you can move it. You need to like expand. A block that has two fragments available and then if it grows again you might have to move it to a block that has more fragments available and then eventually a full block. And it, and it grows slowly, right? Okay. If it grows fast then you won't have a problem, right? But if it grows slowly then it's likely that so if it grows very fast, then it's possible statistically that all the fragments will go to the same file. But if it grows slowly, right, you know, you write the first fragment, wait for a couple of minutes, and then write the second fragment, and so on, then it'll kind of get fragmented, and you get horrendous performance, right? So if you did the sequential read the whole file kind of thing, uh, read or write the whole file kind of thing, you may be uh, getting away with it. But if you if you write it slowly, then you run into problem, right? And most modern file systems do not consider all the last byte of performance as important because, um, because if you did, then you won't do the what we're trying to do, right? The cylinder groups based at least 10% or 20% of the file space, right? So if you're going to waste anything, so why bother, right? Um, so yeah, so now, that, now they have a notion of a cylinder group because essentially you're trying to take a la whole disk, split it up into small, small disk virtually, right? Because you consider each disk to be uh, within easy seek distance, right? And 
the more more of them you have free, the more options you have. The more I can I can do a better job, right? So you at least have to have 10 perform 10 percent, which is you know which people found it to be useful. Uh, you do allow these you, you super user to, to use the last bit of uh, space, it's especially because back in the days, you know, like uh, even now it happens, right? If this is your login partition and and you need to um, you need to write some files to like recover the system. You know, if somebody is using all the disk space, uh, if the supervisor does not have the privilege to override the performance, right, then you you can you can run into bad situations, right? But you're not supposed to stay in the state. So if you if you are at more than ninety percent utilization, then your system will perform really uh, poorly. Um, because at that point, it basically becomes a random allocation, and random allocation goes back to the old file system performance, right? And they do other optimization. They they replicate the super block uh, on the different cylinder groups, and they, they they explain why they do that, right? Um, I'm not sure how relevant that is for for modern systems. So they don't want to have it on one cylinder group. They don't want it to be in one location. They want it spread throughout the disk, right? Um, so because cylinder groups are important. Because if you don't have a cylinder group, I don't know where the different partitions are. I don't know where the different file systems are. Without the cylinder group, without the super block. I have no idea where the partitions are, then I won't be able to look at the file system. So the whole thing is useless, even though the disk, the, the contents are stored somewhere. So you want to replicate it. It's not that big, so you can replicate it. So you kind of spread it around the disk. Um, and then you do the, 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 the stuff about this displacement. So you're, you're trying to use heuristics. Uh, all the directories from the same, um, all the files from the same directory would tend to be accessed together. So you, you try to play tricks with those. <coughs> With the caveat that you don't know how big the files are going to be, you don't know how big the directories are going to be, so you do the best job, but you also have a backup plan where if the directory becomes too large, you have to find another cylinder group, right? And they use different algorithms to find out um, where, 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 where the next block should be, right? So you like to keep them all as close as possible, right? Um, and the lot of things that, a lot of the ugly details of the you know the fact that CPU is involved in all these things meant that you uh, in the operating system have to figure out how soon you can schedule the next stuff and then place the data blocks and stuff right and this is prone to errors because you know um, you don't know how ex these are not real time systems so they don't know exactly how when they can get to the next one so if they miss it then you know you pay the cost right so it's better to thankfully we have disk controllers which take care of all this stuff right and. The notion of fragment, uh, you know, more in detail, you know, they they want to have these fragments to avoid wasting space. But having fragments means that now you have to um, worry about how to manage this stuff. You know, the, the files go slowly, or if the file stays small, I mean, at some point you may you may want to go to. So you have to go from fragment to block, right? So if I send you like a large write of a large size. Then I can say, I want to give you a certain number of blocks and a fragment, then we are OK. But if I send you lots of small small writes slowly, then I'll get a lot of fragments, and then uh, the, the performance is really poor. Right? So the, the, the solution that they said back then was, you know, if you're writing a program, you should write in a block size. right? We don't know, how, I mean, so. Yeah, it's up to you, a programmer, to figure out what to do that. So they added a structure to the stat buff. So when you write a program, you're not supposed to write it directly. You're supposed to find out, ask the file system what the block size is, and then write it on that block size, uh, at least on the multiples of the block size, right? And a lot of the, applica a lot of the utilities still do that. So if you do a copy, right, copy a file, one file to another file, they tend to write, read and write in block sizes, right? They don't, they don't try to read the whole whole file, they try to read in block sizes to get you good performance. If you use the buffered I.O. library like STDIO in C, <coughs> right, that'll do this for you. So if you even if you write lots of small writes, you'll collect everything and then flush it based on the block size that it reads from the file system, right? So you you still were okay because the um, you, you you know even if you write slowly, if you use a, a, a buffered I.O. library, that'll buffer everything and then to the file system send it as one block, right? But if you didn't do that, then you get a poor performance because you have fragmentation, right? Um, yeah, so allocating the, the, the blocks, you want to allocate it within the same cylinder, right? That's the same cylinder would be all the stuff within the same um, the circle thing. 
right? So you try to allocate within the same cylinder. If you can't, you try to allocate within the same cylinder group. If you can't, then you try to find something which is uh, in another cylinder group which is close by. And they found that you know, most of the time you don't run this algorithm. If, the, if you have enough free space, you don't run this algorithm. And the last resort, you have to use random. You just find some block somewhere. And your performance would be at the 2% mark that uh, the old file system was. Right? Um, then you have to worry about a lot of issues of if you have one file taking up all the space, then you don't want all the other files to be using long pointers. So you try to block, I mean, so the inode structure gives you a good point to say from this point on, all sequential access to the rest of the file would be on a different cylinder group. So you get the best of both worlds, right? So you have this jump from um, reading the first end bytes to the, bytes to the rest of the uh, file, but you still get the benefit because you'll go to a different cylinder group, right? Now, of course, the how how you can play this game of like how many files, how many directories go to a cylinder group, how many files go to a cylinder group, gets you good performance. The challenge here is we don't know how big the directory of file could become, so. Depending on how lucky you are, you get good performance. Depending on how awful, you know, how, how bad you, you do, um, you can get bad performance, right? How, how, how can you as a user um, influence the system? Should you create lots of directories? Suppose you have no good reason to do either way, right? Does it make sense for you to create lots of directories? I guess it depends on what you do with the directories afterwards, right? Um, you can fool the system by creating a lot of directories and then just populating some directory because if you create a lot of directories, you'll have to kind of randomly put them into different cylinder groups, right? Then whatever directory you, you tend to use, um, if they happen to be on the same cylinder groups, then you don't get good performance, right? So you, it, it may, you may want to sort them based on the directories that you hope to populate the most so you may get better performance, right? So one of the reasons why they don't actually give you performance uh, benchmarks and stuff is all this, the behavior of the system depends on how well their heuristics match what the real world would be, right? They can show a really, really good system. So I think the, I don't think the research that they show is contrived. They can really make it contrived to get really good performance, right? How would you make it a really good, how would you set up a benchmark to show that the system is really fantastic? What's the best way to get the best performance to show that this system is way better than, it can get, achieve better than 47%, right? How would you design a benchmark? Can you design a benchmark where all the optimization that they're using would work, right? How would you design it? So how many directories would you have? You would have the number of directories equal to the number of cylinder groups, right? Because then you don't have to decide. Then you don't leave it to chance, right? So this is each cylinder group, how many files you would have, right? You would have enough files to use all the blocks within <coughs> cylinder group, right? You don't want to have a large file because large file means at some point you have to allocate to a different cylinder group. So I have to choose the number of files to be such that the I don't face this differentiation, right? So I create certain number of large files. So the, ideally, I would like the file size to be one track, right, or one cylinder, right? Because then, by the allocation, all the, f the first file will get all the stuff within the cylinder, second file will get all the cylinder. Since they don't grow, the allocation would be sequential, right? So I would you know, create a directory, write a file, by calculating what the size would be. So if, if I believe that there are, you know, how many um, sectors within that one track, right? And if it happens to be, let's say, 10 megabytes, I create a 10 megabyte file, I create a 10 megabyte file, I create a 10 megabyte file, etc., right? So if I do that, I'll get fantastic performance, right? Because that way, I get cylinder groups because all access is going to the same thing. And I, you know, I get sequential read and sequential write performance, right? And they can, let's say they show performance of like 90%, right? 
I would argue that we should cry fall because that's completely contrived. I mean, that's based, breaking all the constraints that they have to worry about, which is they don't know how big the files are going to be, they don't know how big the directories are going to be, right? So fixing the benchmark to exactly do what they're optimizing for, I think is awful, right? So the way they did that was more of sort of, you know, it, on, on average it seems to be a good kind of thing. So a um, lot more people value that than playing those games, right? Uh, but but that's use, I mean, you know, again, the reason there was, you know, it, it's in use, so the, the proof is in the uh, existence of this, I mean, you know, file system, right? Um, so, in the, in the time left over, I would like to talk about how modern file systems are. But before we do that, um, this is, what do you think of the paper? Which concepts they, they, that they developed do you think are irrelevant now? Mm -hmm. before you write the driver mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. some important routine so that you maximize the performance. So you think that's important? Yes. Okay, so let's look at what the modern hard drive looks like, right? I, I, I want to get back to it because um, one of the reasons why I think the hard, so two things. One, the modern file system still try to use this model, right? Still try to optimize for this model of seek and all those things, right? They, you know, seek and um, rotation latency and all those things, right? So they try to learn those from the disk. You know, so they ask the disk, you know, what, what kind of a disk you, are you, how, big, how fast do you rotate and all those, how many tracks you have and stuff. And this tells you what it is and then you try to optimize based on that, right? Yeah. I guess, I mean, I mean, like, like, you know, video cards, they don't do, you know, they don't do integer math, you shouldn't try to do integer yeah. math. No, 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 I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm gonna say you why this may not be um, all this stuff, right? So you, you tell all, you, know, you you have cooperation with this, with the file, uh, for the system, right? And one of the things that you don't do is like, you, you know you have disk control, <coughs> right? Most of modern operating system would not run on a, on a hard drive which had no disk controller, right? Most of the drivers won't know how to deal with the stuff that they're talking about, which is I need to figure out when my next object can be, because they know that, Right now, they don't do this. They don't have to do the scheduling, right? They, they, they still the 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 system, the the hard drive, and it'll it'll do the. So you can say, I want block one, two, three, and four. It doesn't have to worry about that. You know, if I ask for one, I cannot possibly ask for the second because the disk would have rotated, right? They don't have to worry about that because the disk controller does that, and and they know that this buffer, there's some cache on the disk, so they don't have to worry about those details, right? Um, so one of the problems with, with that approach is the remapping thing I, I talked about, right? The remapping stuff of uh, how uh, things become invalid. Um, so from a logical perspective, we said files are accessed sequentially, right? Files are accessed sequentially, are, you know, from beginning to end, right? Which is what the next paper, the previous paper talked about, right? Let's assume that's true. Let's assume that files are Always, start, you know, you always open the file, read till the end, and you close it, right? Does that mean that at the file system level, you will see block requests from one through n from that file, right? There are two things going on, right? So you may be reading a file from one to n from a single file, right? But at the level we are talking about is inside the operating system. I, if you operate on two files, right, the temporal co in interleaving of those two files, right, does that make sense, right? So suppose you have one file, right? Actually, suppose there are two files, right? And we said that applications typically open a file, read to the end, and close, right? So let's say the application open and read these blocks and then close, right? It is true for the second application too. Let's say this one is, I say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? So this will be read sequentially, blah, blah, and this will be read sequentially, blah, blah, right? 
at the operating system level, how do you get it? Do you get it as one, two, three, four, up to six, and then A, B, R, do you get it as one, A, two, B, all the previous paper said was each application reads its 